In the previous episodes of this chapter, we learned how to use vectorization to parallelize calculations across vector lanes in each core. Then we talked about how to use OpenMP to scale applications across cores in each processor and coprocessor. Now, in this final episode 4.9 of this chapter, we'll study the next level of parallelism – scaling across multiple compute devices and multiple compute nodes in a cluster environment. We have briefly discussed MPI in the previous chapter, where we talked about programming models for Intel Xeon Phi coprocessors. MPI, or Message Passing Interface, is a communication protocol. It allows multiple processors, which do not share common memory but reside on common network, to perform parallel calculations. MPI allows processors to communicate with each other by way of passing messages. MPI messages are arrays of predefined and user-defined data types. The purpose of MPI messages is defined by the programmer. Messages can be used, for example, for task scheduling, for partitioning the dataset between compute nodes, for exchanging boundary cells in grid calculations. MPI provides an application programming interface for messaging passing and takes care of the network-specific protocols. For instance, MPI messages can travel across a TCP IP network or across an InfiniBand network, but this will be transparent to the programmer. The programmer can therefore focus on expressing the parallel algorithm and expect future portability of the code. Communication fabrics that will appear in the future will eventually be supported by one or another MPI implementation, and the parallel application will be able to run without modification. In the previous chapter, we saw examples that show how MPI applications must be compiled using the special wrappers over the C, C++ or Fortran compiler. To put native MPI processes on Intel Xeon Phi coprocessor, we must set the variable IMPI-MIG equals 1. This applies only to the Intel MPI implementation. The executable file that we run on multiple compute nodes must be somehow delivered to those nodes. This can be done manually or using a distributed file system. Finally, to run an MPI application, we must use the tool MPI Run, to which we give the host names of the compute nodes and coprocessors on which we want to run, and the number of MPI processors for each host. We have already seen the general structure of MPI applications. The typical usage model is that multiple processors run the same application code. In this code, the processors must find each other by calling MPI init. Each process can determine its role in the application by querying two numbers. The first number is the size of the MPI communication world. This is the total number of MPI processes in the current application. The second number is called MPI rank, and this is a zero-based integer, which is the index number of the process. Each process has a unique rank. So using the rank, processes can branch out or partition the problem so that all processes team up to perform a parallel calculation. For convenience, processes may query their respective host names. In order to cleanly terminate an MPI application, all processes must call MPI finalize. Now let's talk about passing messages. There are two ways to pass message in MPI – point-to-point -point and collective communication. There are many flavors of point-to-point -point communication routines, but the basic ones are functions MPI send and MPI receive. In order to send a message, one MPI process must call MPI send and the other MPI receive. Often there will be an if statement in the code which determines which ranks must send and which receive a message. The message itself is an array, in our example an array of characters. Communication functions must specify the location and size of the message, the source and the destination ranks, and they may also specify a tag, which is a user-defined identifier of the message. Additionally, point-to-point -point communication routines may use a communicator, which is a subset of MPI process. The default communicator, which includes all processes, is MPI COM world. Besides point-to-point -point communication, MPI has extensive support for collective messaging. Collective communication in MPI allows more than two processes to exchange messages in certain patterns. For collective communication, there is usually no branch in the code. Each process in the collective communication group calls the same function, typically with the same arguments. Some of the most useful collective communication routines include broadcast, 
In this pattern, one process sends a message to every other process in the communicator, including itself. Scatter. In this pattern, one process distributes parts of the data set to the respective other processes in the communicator. Gather. This is the inverse of scatter. Multiple processes send parts of a data set which are aggregated in the receiver. Reduction. This is similar to reduction in shared memory. A data set is sent from all processes to one process where an associative reduction operation is applied to the data, such as summation, multiplication, binary operations, minimum or maximum calculations. Expressing parallelism with MPI is a huge topic because the MPI functionality is very broad and because the practical applications of this functionality has a great variety of principles and subtleties. For more information about programming in MPI, refer to episodes 3.3, Native MPI Applications, and 3.8, Heterogeneous Programming with Coprocessors Using MPI, or to our book, Parallel Programming and Optimization with Intel Xeon Phi Coprocessors. You can find it at xeonphi.com book. Good public resources for learning are the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory Tutorial on MPI or the MPI reference on the MPH website. This episode concludes our introduction to expressing parallelism on the level of vectors, cores, and clusters. In the next chapter, we will revisit automatic vectorization, multi-threading with OpenMP, and distributed computing with MPI in the context of performance optimization on multi-core processors and many-core coprocessors. Thank you for tuning in, and I hope to see you in the next episode.